Hey everybody, welcome to this free edition of our Trader Use Group Weekly Roundup for the trading week ending in August 24th, 2021. I'm Preston Brent. Thanks for tuning in. This week's theme is Lions, Tigers, and Bears. Oh my. Well, before we get into a lot of the detail, just real quick again, we've had another successful quarter for our user group members. Following along with what I'm doing in our secret trader, uh, we're just knocking it out every quarter. Um, if you're not a member of our group, highly encourage you to come in and check us out because we're trading everything. But we've got a couple of strategies that are working very well right now with markets that are going up and down. Grinding higher, but some sharp down moves. And these moves recently, we're, we we uh, kind of predicted. Uh, and we got a lot of really interesting things coming up as we go through Q4 and then the Q1 of next year. So having said all that fun stuff, let's just kind of take a look at where we are right now. So the first thing I want to do is just, just go over and take a look at the index performance for the week. If you can see, everything is in the green, but just barely, right? Um, just a little bit so. Year to date, we're double digits everywhere over. PE ratio, the forward PE, which is the one we really care about, that drives valuations, is a rather high 2204, okay? The dividend yield is 1.34 as of Friday's close. The 10-year treasury moved up huge this past week to 1.46. It's higher by 12 basis points from the prior week. That's, that's a pretty good little move, guys, in a five-day trading period. Um, so it's no wonder that we had um, interest rates move up um, on the long end of the curve. The earnings yield for the S&P sitting at a healthy 4.61%. Essentially, that would be taking a year-end estimate of earnings per share of 205, dividing it by the current close of the SPX. Here, I just use the E-mini futures at 44.46. So that gives us an S&P earnings yield of 4.61. Very healthy. So the S&P yield over the 10-year Treasury, again, is a healthy 3.15%. So it's no wonder that we continue to get money pouring into the equity markets. And there's still a lot of money on the sidelines, okay? The current VIX actually fell a little over 14, almost 15% for the week. Closed out the week at 17.75. The prior week, we were in the 20s, the low end at 20.81. So we gave up a lot of all this week, too. The yield curve or the term structure of volatility is back in the contango on the front end. The back end has always been in contango. So as I told our members, we were never really in a dire situation. It was kind of an orderly move down. Now, if you guys know and have been watching me on these free roundups, I've been saying we should get a 5 to a 10% pullback. I started talking about it about 60 days ago, over a couple of months. Um, same thing last year. Now, last year we got over a 10% pullback in the months of September. So far, we've had about 5.4%. Can we go back lower? Well, I'm watching the um, potential for a, uh, uh, a bull trap, but the higher we move, the bull trap starts to go away a little bit. I'll show you the charts here in a minute. Now, if we break it down and just look at the economic data that was kind of hitting the wires last week, um, we started off the week, Monday, we had a huge down day on Monday. All right, a lot of that was caused by China's, one of their largest property developers, Evergrande. He kind of set off a potential fear of global financial contagion. If you guys are following me here, especially remember, I started talking about it about four weeks ago, five weeks ago. So just talking about what can happen there. Uh, so we do see... Um, uh, that affect the markets at the beginning of the week. But in the middle of the week, we had uh, uh, Jerome Power Ranger, Boom Boom Powell from the feds. They came out. He kind of threaded the needle. Uh, basically, as widely expected, they announced that they would start to taper, but that was kind of factored into the central bank's uh, message. It was factored into price action. Okay, According to the FOMC, you know, they also updated their summary of economic projections. They're now looking at the timing of an interest rate li liftoff. It's kind of evenly split uh, right now. It's evenly split between 22 and 2023. Um, and additionally, a majority of the officials now anticipate at least a three quarter a 75 basis point rate hike by the end of 2023. I think it's going to be more than that. But that's what's forecasted into the current markets right now. Um, so that's a little bit about what we're seeing. And then also on the economic front, um, 
we got first time jobless claims rising over 350,000. Uh, that's the highest number we've seen in a little bit of time. We're also getting a survey of manufacturing and services sector activity in September. Came in a little bit lower, still above 50, so in an expansionary mode, but a little bit lower from the prior month. Housing data came in on the upside, obviously. Okay, So we're seeing some of that um, uh, bring itself out. U.S. Treasuries, um, the um, monthly asset purchases, as announced by the Fed, the tapering is probably going to start. There's a bet between whether it's going to start in November or December. We will see. Um, but that drove the 10-year yield to an intraday peak this week of 1.47. It's the highest level we've seen in the 10 years since the start of July this summer. So we're starting to see some action in the interest rate market. Banks should like that a little bit. Now, if we come over and we look at Europe, and let's just look at the data out of Europe. Everything was in the green. The Euro stocks, FTSE, CAC 40, DAX, all the major indexes across Europe solidly in the green. Year to date, solidly in double digits, with the exception of the FTSE in Great Britain. They're just slightly under 10% for the year at 915 all right. The Bank of England also met, and they kept their rates unchanged at 10 basis points. Um, but I believe the Bank of England, everybody's expecting them to hike their rates a couple of times um, in 2022. So we're going to see a lift off in interest rates on the Bank of England much sooner than here in the U.S. They got ex inflation expectations above 4% well into 2022, although inflation uh, data here in the U.S., is also pretty high, okay? So we're also seeing a slowing pace of manufacturing and services um, data across Europe and in Great Britain, primarily due to higher inflation. All right? So we're getting some of that activity, basically echoing the activity here in the U.S., some slowing of economic activity. And then, of course, if we come over and look at the Asian markets, starting with Japan first, their, um, the polls show that their, their minister, their vaccination minister, Taro Kono, is probably going to be uh, elected. Uh, and the reason why the markets have been very strong, as you can see in Nikkei, it's up over 9% for the year. That's very strong. All in the red in the Asian markets just for the week. But year to date, the Nikkei is very strong, primarily because the projected uh, lead favored candidate, Kono is very supportive of additional stimulus. So the markets love more money, right? Meanwhile, the Bank of Japan also met this past week. They had no changes to their long or short-term interest rate policies, and they confirmed their stance on maintaining asset purchases at the current level. So really, um, this past week, we had the Feds and Boom Boom Powell threading the needle Everybody pretty much expects the tapering to begin, quantitative tightening, tightening to begin this year. Interest rate lift off, it's kind of a mixed bag. Some of the dot plot feds, almost half of them said it'll begin late next year. Others said early 2023. I believe they're going to have to raise the rate sooner than everybody thinks, but that's not factored into the market right now. Okay. So we'll see how that plays, its stuff, uh, plays itself out. Meanwhile, in China, which caused some of the contagion effect earlier this week, um, many analysts, I think, believe that China is going to step in and help contain some of the financial fallout from uh, the Evergrande bankruptcy. It's one of the largest real estate developers. To give you an idea of scale and scope of Evergrande, they've got 800 projects currently underway right now that they've frozen in 200 different major cities on uh, mainland China. That's huge, folks. Now, the contagion effect pretty much doesn't just, it starts in real estate, but then once they can't pay their bills and they're holding invoices from the concrete to steel to commodity suppliers that supply them to the income that people make on providing a lot of other components to all these big real estate projects, it just spreads. So that's why a lot of analysts believe that China is not going to let it spread to outside um, the real estate sector. All right. The real estate sector in China is only about six or seven percent of their gross GDP. So I think China is going to figure out a way to contain it to the real estate sector and not let it go into a contagion. So that is helping 
uh, the sentiment out of the um, Asian markets, primarily China. And that's why we kind of came up off the lows early in the week and closed just slightly into the green, right? So that's a little bit about what we're seeing there. Now what I want to do is take you over the charts, show you a couple of key charts, just kind of show you how things shaped up. So I'm going to just switch the screen here. Let me take you over to the daily chart of the S&P 500 E-mini futures. <laughs> And you're going to see here, uh, it takes a few seconds to pop up on the screen. I've got the daily chart, uh, and you're going to see we've regained that key level of the 50 EMA. Now, remember, this was the first time in over 281 days that we had two closes below the 50 EMA. The last time that happened was in September of last year, right? Uh, and into October when we had that 10% pullback. And I said that this will be our watch. Once we close below, and then if we move lower than the previous bar, and we close lower than the previous bar, the probabilities favor another 5% move lower. We didn't get that. The buy the dip crowd, we fell another 100 points. Uh, we bottomed at 4,293, just slightly under 4,300, okay? And then boom, away we went. We regained the 50 EMA, and then we closed above it uh, on Friday. You can see that candle almost looks like a, um, a doji, but it's really at this point in time, um, right now, going into early next week, we must hold that 50 EMA. That'll give the bulls confidence to take us up. Now, the key level for me, as far as whether we're in the buy the dip or not, has not been the 50 EMA. The 50 EMA was just a measure of, will the buy the dip crowd stand aside and let us go lower? And I thought we would go a little bit lower than we did, probably by another 150 points or so. We didn't get there because the buy the dip crowd was so strong, but they just came in here and you can see we closed right back up near that pivot point right there, okay? But the key level is gonna be right here, right? It's almost like a little bit of a zone right in that area there. And let's just call it, for lack of a better thing, around 44.75, okay? Now, I know 44.50 right up in this area is also a key level. You can see the 44.50 area here uh, capturing a lot of support and our resistance. But until we can clear that 44.75 area and hold that on a follow-through day with nice volume, then I think we're going to come up and take that out. Is that going to happen? Well, who knows? You can't predict the future. But the momentum clearly has us up. Again, off of this Elliott Wave 5, we get the common ABC Elliott Wave pattern. We got to watch this very, very closely. All right. If I were to connect the dots, we're sitting somewhere like this right now. So we're near the peak here. It would suggest a roll back over again. Keep in mind, um, we had a... Um, September is coming in as forecast right now, right? September typically is one of the down months um, uh, for the S&P. If I were to put this on a monthly chart, just to kind of show you where we are right now, and let's just blow it up. You can see on this monthly chart right here that we opened up here around this level, around the 4527, we're down around 4445. So we're down just a little bit. If I measure from where we open to where we're down, right? We're down right at about 1.77%. And that is roughly the average down move in the month of September, okay? Roughly. But that is the monthly candle. You can see it looks like We've got a very strong tail down here, right? You can see it goes all the way down to 42.93, and then it pushed it all the way back up here. That's the buy the dip crowd, okay? We got the MACD starting to flatten a little bit. That tells me that the upside, if it hasn't already been made, it's very near. Now, the month of October, we got a lot of big things coming out, primarily earnings. Everybody's going to be focused on earnings, and within the earnings, everybody's going to be focused on profit margins. And if you look at FedEx and a few others,
they'd beaten on top line, they'd missed on bottom line margins and earnings per share. FedEx sold off pretty big. They're hiring, they're raising their uh, labor uh, hourly wage weight, rate to get more people in to work for them for Christmas, uh, holiday buying season. So I think you're going to see the hourly um, average uh, rate that people are paid goes higher. So you're going to see this here start to translate into some sideways, possibly even more choppy movement in the markets. Now, we're going to get a better idea in another couple of weeks when earnings start to kick off. But if you look at this chart here um, on this daily time frame, it does tend to suggest that we could just easily roll over once we hit a little bit of a peak here. Again, the 50 EMA, we have to follow very closely. Okay. And of course, if we come in here, and, and we follow uh, some of our other stuff here. Like if we look at um, the um, NASDAQ, we look at the NASDAQ area, we regain the 50 EMA here. We held it here. This pattern would suggest that, and if you see it, it's a one, two, three leg. That would indicate we're looking for a four leg, which can be a little bit of a consolidation sideways pattern. There's a lot of patterns for an Elliott wave four. And then we roll back over and come down even lower. But you can just see here that that may not necessarily be right. Uh, we've got to watch, again, the 50 EMA. If we go back below it a second time, then I think we're going to take out the, the lows that we made the first time we went lower. Okay. And then, of course, if we come over here and look at the Russell, we're still in our um, resistance zone here. We're over the 50 EMA, but we're just, we've been going sideways. Look at that chart. If I were to ask you, would you want to trade this chart? The only answer is I could day trade it fairly easy, just selling up here and buying down here or trading very wide iron condors or selling puts deep out of the money, uh, selling calls deep out of the money, right? That would be an easier trade. In fact, the easier trade would be selling calls deep out of the money rather than puts because the the risk and probability of a faster move is going to be still to the downside, not the upside. Okay. Now, and then finally, if we look at the Dow, if we look at the Dow futures, you're going to see, um, let me just find it on here. I know we're on here somewhere. Here we go, right here. The Dow futures are a little bit more damaged. You can see here where we fell below the 50 EMA and we're testing the 50 EMA now, but we could not quite get up above it this week. You can see we were running here and we just can't get up above it. So remember all the indexes, some run hotter than others, but they all generally go in the same direction. When you have a bifurcation, meaning you got one index going down and another index, major US index going up, generally the one going up or down, they will reverse course and come back together again. One will always outperform the other, but they generally go in the same direction. So if we have the uh, the Dow give up and start to roll over, we may see it translated in a rollover into the NASDAQ and then followed by the Russell um, and the um, uh, S&P 500 E-mini futures. If we come down here and look at volatility, as I showed you, it closed at 17.75 this week. You can see how high we got. Now in our option masters, I reviewed with our members um, just some more thoughts on volatility and one of the easier, higher probability ways of trading volatility. Most people don't understand volatility. You can tell when you ask them how they trade volatility. They either take a lot of risk and they go far out in time and they sell vol futures. It's a very high risk trade. Or they will say, well, I buy calls on um, VIX or I buy calls on VXX. That's the wrong way to trade volatility, everybody. Um, we spent some time on it, and I showed our members where you have a 90%, 85 to 90% probability of success on trading volatility the right way. We had members trying it out after I showed them, and they're so far hitting 100% on their trades. So um, again, it's just something you need to understand, right? Most people don't understand how vol really works from an options perspective. And that's what you got to understand before you jump in and try and trade it. But you can see we're back into the yellow zone. Again, the yellow zone is typically characterized by choppy markets, right? Um, we have not been in the green since last February. In the green is generally holding an intraday close below 15, roughly. 
we've been elevated up between 15 and 20 um, for quite some time. And then when the markets decide they roll over, we move up into this zone here between 20 and 30 from a VIX perspective, right? Uh, we did take out these two prior highs because it kind of shocked the market with Evergrande early in the week. And we had, I think, the hardest down day we had in quite some time uh, in the markets. <clears throat> still wasn't bad. And as I was telling our members, it's still orderly. I mean, it was an orderly move instead of chaotic. Okay. If we come down here and look at treasuries, well, if we look at the 10-year, guess what, guys? It is moving higher, as I've been saying. I told you guys that even though it's choppy, and I've told our members, you want to be long rates, but you just need to add duration to the trade. You need to buy yourself some time. Trying to trade it week to week or month to month is very difficult. So boom, away we go. And if we look at bonds, it's the same token to the downside, right? Look at bonds finally giving it up. Now, I think bonds is going to move a lot lower even still. We may have another challenge to the 50 EMA, but if you trade bonds, you got to add duration to your trade, meaning going out at least 120 days. Now, there's some great trades in the bond market, primarily in bond futures. Members, I'll go through one of those with you guys this weekend on our weekly market watch this Sunday evening. All right. There's a whole nother series of trades in currencies. If we look at the dollar, the dollar is really coming back up, trying to break out. If we break out up here and the dollar runs, remember currencies tend to run. The dollar is off the lows that were made in May of this year, in the summer months, and then away we go. But it's a very choppy trade, all right? I think longer term, I want to be bullish the euro short the dollar. Near term, I think the dollar still got some more legs to the upside, okay? Um, and then, of course, if we come down here and we look at gold, gold kind of finished the day really almost flat longer term i think gold will move higher short term meaning the rest of these year i think we're not going to see a really big movement in gold probably until sometime in q late q1 q2 of next year all right that's kind of what i'm seeing in gold right now um copper i think copper is going to move higher uh there's just a lot of fundamental factors that are adding to long copper we all know that electric vehicles is going to be just getting more and more as a percentage of total vehicles on the road. And I'm talking globally, not just here in the U.S., but it's going to be here in the U.S. as well. So and you're seeing some states like California and others, they're really trying to just outlaw and ban gas powered vehicles by 2040, 2050 kind of time frame. Really crazy. They will never ban gasoline powered automobiles, but you're going to see the percentage go up of EVs to gas. Now, what does that mean in the copper market? Well, they use 40% more copper for every EV car than they do for a gas-powered car. So that's only going to put upward pressure long-term on copper, right? Short reindeer games being played. China has a copper reserve. The U.S., oh, we got some oil reserve. China, or China has reserves for a lot of different commodities, one of them copper. They started releasing some of their reserve for copper when copper was up in this area up here. And as you can see, it's kind of reduced the price a little bit, but they can't do it forever. And to start up a copper mine, right? Like exploring for more oil. Sometimes you can just pump more oil, but copper, there's only so many mines out there. So I do believe longer term copper is still a nice bullish play. And then of course, if we look at the energy markets, oil eventually is going to roll over. Short term, I think it's going to run up and challenge these. It may even run up and challenge the low 80s, but I think because Europe is having a big time with that gas. And I think um, oil is going to run up a little bit and then roll over. When it hit this area here, I said, let's fade this move. I think it'll take that move out and then it'll be worth fading again. Right now, you want to be neutral to bullish oil. Nat gas, well, nat gas just is doing what I want it to do. We had this peak here. Nat gas in Europe is just going to get crushed for the winter months, okay? Um, and I think it's going to take this high out. It's going to set us up for a nice downside play. Um, I told our members right here, you could step in front of this trade and just fade it down by doing a tight um, bear put spread. It turned out to be a nice, successful uh, trade. But I said an, a higher probability trade is if we come down, we it's profit taking mode. We come back up and then we get a better price for selling. And then you ride it down a little bit further. 
That's what I think is going to happen with that gas. Now, we got a lot of other moving parts in this market. There are some interesting stocks and a few other things that members I'll be reviewing with you this Sunday evening. If you're not a member, I highly encourage you to come in and check us out. Otherwise, have a really great uh, weekend, everybody. Enjoy football or whatever you want to do. Members, I will see you this Sunday night for our weekly market watch. Take care, everybody. Ciao.